Nonviolence section. Sites of violence, the United States and Vietnam. What rendered the boundaries between violence and nonviolence especially fluid and problematic was the advent of another problem. In 1966, Stokely Carmichael recounted the death of a civil rights activist in Vietnam to Martin Luther King in these terms. Quote, you told him to be not violent in Mississippi. He didn't get shot there, but he got shot in Vietnam. You should have told him to not be violent in Vietnam. That's what your problem is. You didn't carry your stuff like you say you're supposed to carry it. End quote. In other words, how could the commitment to nonviolence be rendered consistent in a situation where conscription threatened, where people were forced to fight in a far-off country and to kill and be killed? Arendt, articulating the basic orientation of white liberals, vainly lamented the waning violence of the slogan of nonviolence and insisted on the fact that, in spite of everything, the United States continued to be a democratic country. Quote, Up until now, there has been no torture here, nor do concentration camps exist, nor terror. End quote. This line of argument completely avoided the key question. While they had not made their appearance in the United States, torture, concentration camps, and terror had exploded in Vietnam. Did those who were committed to not exceeding the limits of nonviolence in their struggle against the regime of white supremacy? and yet accepted becoming participants in the violence and terror unleashed by that regime against another people of color thousands of miles away, really demonstrate political consistency and moral rigor? Were black power activists who encouraged refusal of the draft and were ready to clash with the duly constituted power over this, champions of violence or nonviolence? At the outset, The protest movement against the Vietnam War did not involve King. In 1965, he still believed U.S. President Lyndon Johnson's promise that he wanted talks. It was therefore necessary to render the delicate transition, quote, from the battlefield to the peace table, as easy and painless as possible, and hence, quote, the issues of culpability and morality, while important, had to be subordinated lest they divert or divide, end quote from King. The government was still trusted. Even as it unleashed brutal violence, it professed its desire to pursue negotiations. When regarded as temporary, violence seemed tolerable. The subsequent progressive intensification of military operations and bombing introduced a new element into the situation. The bloodier the war became, and the more terroristic the U.S. bombing campaigns, the more difficult it proved to confine the profession of faith in nonviolence to the metropolitan territory. Quote, As the hopeful days became disappointing months, I began the agonizing measurement of government promising words against the baneful, escalating deeds of war. Doubts gnawed at my conscience. End quote. Following this phase of hesitation, the turn finally came. Quote, One night I picked up an article entitled The Children of Vietnam, and I read it. And after reading that article, I said to myself, Never again will I be silent on an issue that is destroying the soul of our nation and destroying thousands and thousands of little children in Vietnam. End quote. It was no longer possible to remain silent. And in fact, the silence maintained hitherto was revealed to be unjustifiable. Beginning a long quote. I saw an orderly buildup of evil, an accumulation of inhumanities, each of which alone was sufficient to make men hide in shame. I now stood naked with shame and guilt, as indeed every German should have under the Third Reich, when his government was using its military power to overwhelm other nations. Whether right or wrong, I had for too long allowed myself to be a silent onlooker. End of long quote. A radical break with his attitude was now required. Beginning of long quote. Had I not, again and again, said that the silent onlooker must bear the responsibility for the brutalities 
committed by the Bull Connors, champions of white racism, or by the murderers of the innocent children in a Birmingham church? Had I not committed myself to the principle that looking away from evil is, in effect, a condoning of it? Those who lynch, pull the trigger, point the cattle prod, or open the fire hoses act in the name of the silent. I had to therefore speak out if I was to erase my name from the bombs which fall over North or South Vietnam, from the canisters of Nepal. The time had come, indeed it was past due, when I had to disavow and disassociate myself from those who, in the name of peace, burn, maim, and kill. End quote. Consistency in the commitment to nonviolence demanded public, unequivocal condemnation of the war in Vietnam. A fact must be registered. Quote, Today, young men of America are fighting, dying, and killing in Asian jungles. Moreover, this war played havoc with the destiny of the entire world. It tore up the Geneva Agreement, seriously impaired the United Nations, exacerbated the hatreds between continents and, worse still, between races. In sum, I tell you this morning, I would not fight in the war in Vietnam. End quote. But not all of King's collaborators were prepared to follow him on this path. Did it not risk a breach with the Johnson administration, which had shown itself inclined to accept some of the civil rights movement's demands? Rather than concerning themselves with problems that were bigger than them, thereby antagonizing the only circles in a position to help them, African Americans should focus exclusively on their condition and the improvements that could be made to it. End of section.